Hello, colleagues and Ismael friends. Many greetings from sunny Cyprus. My name is Natasha Economidou Stavro, and I would like to welcome you to this Ismael Online Cafe on behalf of the Advocacy Committee. Thank you for joining our meeting. Uh, the Ismael Online Cafe is an initiative of the Ismael Advocacy Committee, and each online meeting is hosted by one of the Ismael committees, commissions, or special interest groups. The main purpose of Isme Online Cafes is to provide an open platform for all music education, academics, practitioners, and students across the globe, Isme members and non-members, to share, discuss, and reflect on their experiences and narratives while learning from and with one another in an atmosphere of safety, trust, and mutual support. Today's online cafe is hosted by the Early Childhood Music Education Commission, and I am very much looking forward to listening to our amazing presenter, Professor Emily Acuno. By participating in this meeting, we all agree to and take responsibility to the following. We aim to create a welcoming and inclusive environment. We accept and honor diverse perspectives, we cultivate a sense of belonging and trust. We cultivate open and honest communication. We foster the health and well being of all participants. We listen, we respond, and disagree respectfully and avoid judgmental statements towards others. I would also like to note that after the session ends, you will receive in your email a link for a five minute evaluation survey which will help us create the best possible engagement experience for all participants in future online cafes. I will now give the floor to Lauren Quistra, uh, the chair of the ECME Commission, to welcome you, give you some information about the ECME Commission and commissioners, and introduce our presenter. So, so dear Lauren, the virtual microphone is yours. Thank you, Nusasa. Thank you, everyone. I want to say a special thank you to Ryan and to Shri, who have organized all of the details of this today. And thank you to Emily for being here with us and being willing to speak to us and um, have this conversation with us. And welcome to all of you. And thank you to all of you. It's really fun to see in the chat all the different places that we're all arriving from today. So um, thank you for being here. We um, are really grateful. And we're really excited about this cafe, this is the second of three that the ECME uh, commissioners are planning for um, leading up to July in Helsinki. And so um, keep your ears open about the third one that we hope to be in the early 2024. But today um, we are um, here to, uh, the, the purpose of these cafes we've been um, planning have been to, has been to think about the theme for 2024. And so um, we're really excited to, to hear what um, Emily has to share with us. Um, where's my, oh, okay. So the schedule today is that I'm giving you this little welcome and then Emily will um, present what she has to share with us. We'll have time for a Q and A session with her and we'll take a short break and then we'll get back and into some breakout rooms and have some conversation together before we wrap it up at the end. So it will go quickly, but this is our general plan for the session. And I just want to take a minute to introduce to you who the ECME commissioners are in case you don't know. So I am Lauren Coistra and I am based in the USA and I am technically the chair of ECME, but here today to host this session with me is Lara Hutainen Hilden, who is from Finland. She is um, the host university for this, uh, the pre-conference seminar in 2024, and we couldn't do anything without her. And then we have Alyssa Johnson Green, who is also based in the USA, and she'll be um, hosting the breakout or the Q and A session um, through the uh, during this time. Then we also have present with us is Zoe Dionis Diani um, who is based in Greece and Jessica Pitt, who is based in the UK, and they are just participants today, but you can find them in your um, view in on the side. We also have Jill Holland, who's based in Australia, so she's hopefully sleeping right now. But this is the ECME Commission, and we're really um, grateful to have you here. We probably don't need this anymore, but just to keep in mind, keep your microphone muted during the presentation. We'll have Q&A afterwards where you can either raise your hand 
literally or um, through the Zoom or put a question in the chat. That's how we'll navigate that space. So I am really excited to welcome Dr. Emily Acheng Akuna. She is the Vice Chancellor of Jaramogi Oginga Odinga University of Science and Technology in Bondo, Kenya. She is the past president of ISME and has served as commissioner and chair of MISTEC, the Music in School and Teacher Education Commission through ISME. She has also served as president and treasurer of the International Music Council, and she is the founding chair of the Music Education Research Group Kenya, a network of Kenyan higher music education practitioner researchers who are keen on, quote, looking at ours to build ours, end quote towards the growth of a robust music scholarship and practice in Kenya and the region. Emily's research, writing, and teaching cover the concepts, contexts, contents, and procedures of music and music education, with a recent interest in what music does and can achieve in society. We have invited Emily here today to speak to us about her perspective in connection to our 2024 pre-conference seminar theme, Enhancing a Sustainable Future with Music in Early Childhood. This theme hopes to unpack the many layers involved for young children and their musical behaviors and experiences. Because as researchers and practitioners, we desire to nurture lifelong beneficial musical spaces. And so we are delighted with the topic of Emily's talk today, Power in Children's Songs, Learning Through Mischief. I just wanna say that I had the privilege of meeting and interacting with Emily at the ISME board meeting this summer. And I learned firsthand that she is a woman of great insight and great wisdom. I thank you, Emily, for your willingness to be here today with us to share your thoughts and experience. And I have no doubt that we will leave this meeting encouraged and inspired in our work with young children. So without any further delay, please welcome Dr. Emily Okuno. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, ladies and gentlemen, good evening from Kenya. Good morning to some of you and good very evening to, to others of you. And it's great seeing 43 of us. That is exciting. I noticed there's a Kenyan who is calling in from Myanmar. I've never been there. I hope I'll get there one day and I uh, have a feeling they've got some good music as well. Thank you all. I, I note that we are, uh, because because Isme is like that, we are generally technically from all over the world. I saw somebody from Brazil. I, I see people from this, this the UK. Um, Hey, Yang, where are you calling in from? I'm just, you know, my, my concept of the world is, <laughs> is interesting. There are parts of the world to my left, and that is mostly Asia. And then at the top, I've got the whole of Europe and anything that I call Europe. And then to the west, to my left, are the Americas. And I believe we are all represented here. Let me invite you, welcome you to Isme, the place where things, music and music education happen. I'd like to thank so much natasha and um for the for the the brief introduction at the beginning and uh and uh, lauren and ekme for this introduction and for the opportunity to come and talk about some of the things that i enjoy thinking about when i am sane and sober and when i need to restore sanity and sobriety to into my little brain and um, it is always a pleasure to think about music, but especially children's music, childhood music. So without um, too much further ado, let me just share my screen. I'm going to share sound and I think I'll just share a portion of the screen and let's see what that might look like. So just give me a second. Somebody asked me if I do talk to myself all the time, and of course I do, <laughs> just to make sure that everything is fine. So the title that I have is The Power of Children's Songs, Learning Through Mischief. And you'll probably be asking yourself, why mischief? Why am I using that phrase mischief? Perhaps you'll get to understand a little more. And uh, again, I want to re reiterate my appreciation and also to the children 
who normally share their music so freely. Um, and and if you, when you come around Africa, you might realize that kids have no shame in singing. They sing very freely. So they share their musical abilities and musical knowledge very, very freely. Uh, the description of the session uh, was already given. It would have been an abstract, but uh, something a little about the classification of children's songs. And this came from research that I did a while back, and I have not seen reason to change that classification. Um, I am very keen on the relationship between context and content of our music behaviors because they have an impact on quite a, a number of things. And that is where the mischief element comes in. And uh, then what activities uh, are involved in childhood music making? Because out of those activities, we get to appreciate how learning happens and what kind of learning happens. And if we can appreciate that, we might just be able to reconfirm or assert or understand or appreciate the value of music in childhood experiences. And therefore we can see whether they do or whether they can or, or where they fit in the teaching and learning process, learning of music and learning through music. And, and that is important if we are going to be considering sustainability um, of childhood music. I noticed Elizabeth, Elizabeth Andango, who's from Kenya. And in my opinion, she is the Kenyan expert in early childhood. My research was not in early childhood. And that is why I say very little about early childhood. I just talk about children's songs. So this should be what we talk about. And as you can see, I'm very wordy. So don't let me talk for too long. But Kenya, no, not that one. Kenya, I found something... there's more to Kenya than uh, <laughs> the Maasai. Kenya has, we've got about 43 communities. The Maasai is just, just one of the communities and, and we've got all the animals and all of that. But I was keen on letting you see the part of the globe where Kenya um, is found. Now, if you found someone doing something it is likely that you might ask them, what are you doing? And in asking them what they're doing, it is not necessarily because we cannot see what they're doing or we cannot hear what they're saying, but it is likely to be because we cannot identify what it is that they're doing because it is different from the kinds of things that we do. We cannot identify their activity with our, with any of our activities, with any of our traditions or any of our experiences because they are unfamiliar. Watch this. And so we, if we ask them, what are you doing? And they say, music. Do we have the grace, the humility, the patience to see what they are doing and calling music through their eyes or to hear it with their ears, to consider its legitimacy and to acknowledge the role that it plays in their existence? I have found this 
question, these questions, they've bothered me severally. And I keep asking myself that when I go to a place that I'm visiting for the first time, can I recognize the unfamiliar as being genuine and authentic? Because though it is not my experience, it is another's experience. And for me, this is how I have engaged with children's music, which I consider as a body of artistic cultural literature that might mean nothing or the whole world, depending on who is contemplating it. I remember the literature that I went through. Uh, I, think, I think my first solid literature on children's music was the publication by OP and OP. Uh, they were talking about English children's music. Um, you, I'm sure uh, people are familiar with the writings of Margaret Barrett, Akoso Ado, who writes to us um, about children's music in, in Ghana. Paminas Maturi has written something from Zimbabwe. Jimmy Simako, the late, wrote something about Seswana children's music, the music of, of the children of Botswana. And recently, I found something on YouTube again, or was it through LinkedIn, that was talking about Afghanistan's children's song repertoire. And I thought that was really cool. But in all these writings, it is evident that children derive a lot from music activities. First is the fun, the joy. I'm, I hope you saw those kids just seeming to be having a lot of fun. So there's the entertainment value of the music, but then there are also lessons. There's technical knowledge that they derive from the music. There's also cultural information that they absorb in engaging with the music. But how about the physical exercise that allow them to grow physiologically? There's the dexterity that is, that is uh, developed, manipulation of certain things, certain objects in the environment, the negotiation of complex actions, and we'll probably see some of those, and I'm sure you've seen them, especially when you have to combine singing with action, and sometimes you have to make quick, small gestures and movements. That is a little complex. And, and, and these are some of the benefits that children would derive, derive from their music. And I think this is where the consideration of the function of music needs to come in. There's recreational, there's work and ritual, all those functions of music. And I have learned that even children's music fall into these three categories. And I discovered that for the children's music, the ritual function would be perhaps the songs that kids sing when they have lost a tooth. It is fulfilling some role. A long time ago, I did some research and my focus was on Kenyan children's songs. And um, when I decided to work on that, I quickly realized that it was a very significant body of literature, but it was not readily accept accessible to myself. In my own community where we have lots of songs and there are lots of children's songs, I knew just slightly less than five children's songs from my community. And I wondered how my socialization had left them out. Or I thought maybe it was just some selective amnesia on my part, but I soon discounted that because I decided to think instead that it was a secluded socialization. My socialization had happened in a probably different space that didn't allow me an opportunity to learn all of that. What is that space? We had sung English folk songs and English children's songs in school. My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean, Mary Had a Little Lamb, Row, Row, Row Your Boat, ETC. And these songs had been used as very important important tools, not only for distraction or for language development or just for entertainment, but especially for bringing us into a space where we learned things about another culture, the culture where Mary would have a little lamb, um, you know, that, that kind of space. But we learned very effectively through them. And sometimes we didn't quite know what we sang. 
they sang them anyway until much, much later, the meanings materialize. And I'll give you an example. There's a song that that uh, Kenyan children sing quite a lot in their singing games. I'm going to the country. I'm going to the fair to see. I'll sing it the way we sing it. I'm going to the country. I'm going to the fair to see a Samarita with flowers on his head. And of course, you know, that is not quite the way it is done. It should be, I'm going to the country. I'm going to the fair to see a senorita with flowers on her hair. But that is what we sang. But the songs carried lessons that transcend the play field activities. And in school, our teachers, and I really want to apologize. Uh, my computer is telling me that my internet is not stable, but I hope we'll survive. So we had also learned some topical songs in Kiswahili, but using tunes from elsewhere, like the tune Yankee Doodle was used to teach us um, quite a lot, a lot of things. Then we went to high school and again, we sang a lot of uh, songs, the repertoire um, abounded. I still remember a song uh, called Marianena. I remember Mr. Rabbit, Mr. Rabbit, ETC. And this was because they were facilitating the Western um, or dominated curriculum. Formal education as, as practiced here, you know, came in with, with all that was part of its culture. Let's go back to my studies then. Um, I went to the field and I was so pleasantly surprised to find so much music. And one of the things that I realized was that children sing about anything that is anything and nothing that is nothing. That sounds like a play of words, but it's true. Everything that children sing about, even the ones that have nonsense words, make sense to them and carry some meaning. And I can echo Simako 2009, who tells us that the children's songs resemble and reflect the adults' songs. And I learned that this resemblance and, and reflection happened in three specific ways. Number one, musically, because they are built on similar scales, using similar note values, using similar rhythmic patterns, even though the rate of occurrence, occurrence will be different. So I found... For example, in my research, that some of the children's songs only used a three-note scale. You know, just the first note. That's a lullaby. I also learned that these songs replicate or, or resemble the adult music culturally because they address the things that are in the children's environment, the social environment, the physical environment, the emotional environment. I find this important if we're going to be talking about sustainable futures. I also find, find that the resemblance is at social level because they involve children doing something together. So there's the building of relationships and the, the, the music is a space for growth and development of skills and abilities. So these therefore make these songs very vital sociocultural tools for the musical development of members of the community. I think they are useful when we come to considering um, sustainability, sustainable futures. And as I went through that, I consider the definition what is my definition of children's songs? To your right, I presume. I thought of them as songs that are sung for and sung by children. I thought that they served socialization needs of childhood. I found that they enabled children to negotiate their environment. And this is an environment that is social, that is technical or intellectual, emotional, psychological space that is embedded within a cultural physical setup. Remember I mentioned earlier that there's that relationship between the context and the content. So in terms of the children's songs, there are the songs that are sung for them, the lullabies and cradle songs. And there are songs that are sung by them. The activity songs, which are not very different from singing games, but they spell out the activities. And I found that the singing games don't necessarily say the action that is to be done. 
but the activity songs do. For example, when the Lui here, children in Kenya sing, and they would have, they would mimic the action of sweeping. So we've got activity songs that they sing. We've got technical songs, the songs for learning things, like the counting songs, the songs that tell you about color, the songs that tell you about the geography, the region where one is, the songs of men saying, we know that when we are growing up, we develop theologically ETC. And so the attitude of laziness, it is something that children and, and come in marikone. Laughing at the lazy person who dropped out of school. And instead at home, their mother or their father is begging them, chat me, and they know them if at par. That is the mischief. And those are the mockery songs. So, a little more about the mischief. There is a song here. Ah, let's watch a little bit of this, shall we? Okay, let me leave that. So songs, I'm sure you noticed activities that, that you probably also see, like the clapping games, quite a number of uh, communities have those. Songs communicate. They are a space for learning, especially peer learning, peer education. Children's songs are often picked up on the playground or perhaps in the family especially when children are in the company of older children. It is in this way that they dig at each other, especially the ill-mannered or those who have some unbecoming tendencies and the sweet food that she has. But of course, when it is done in a song, um, the song addresses grandmother, but I mean, this, this, the text, the lyrics of the song talk about grandmother, but it is being sung to a child who is not kind and is not sharing. So there's a double take here. We are being referred to grandmother. And I'm sure you know, no young child likes to be grandmother because it's, you're being told you're old. Uh, and uh, uh, being rebuked for not sharing. So, so that is that is the thing about this threatening space. Why is it not threatening? The playground is a place where we have music. So this that's that aesthetic element of it. The participation is usually voluntary in the music games activities, but that sting of the ridicule or censure or condemnation soon wears off because the singer's attention is drawn, drawn to something else. There's also the beauty of the melody that suits this, that bruised ego, uh, that bruised ego, sorry. But the lesson is driven home. 
So what are some of the activities that happen um, when children engage in singing? They listen, don't they? And in the process of listening, they listen to the melody and the instructions that are in the song. And these instructions will evoke particular activities. But in the listening, there's also the musical listening and musical learning that happens. Then they sing and they get to exercise their primarily personal yet most expressive music instrument, the voice. But they play, they play games. They, they play, there's, 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 there's some playfulness that is happening. The movement, for example, dancing, that is also happening. But there is some analysis that goes on. We are not always conscious of it. And I believe there is an automatic analysis of the song and the movement for the performer to decipher what to do when. There's that synchronizing of activity and song. And even how to sing the particular song with all the sounds that are generally in the environment. So there's analysis that goes on. And then there's creating creating your response or creating your own movement or creating your reaction to that music. What do they do and how do they learn? Remember, children tend to organize themselves into teams or in groups, and that is an activity that is altogether very useful. Sometimes there are competitive games. So the selection that occurs and sometimes you feel very sad when you have not been selected. And in the very early years, we have lullabies and cradle songs that are sung to the very restless child. And as that is done, as they're rocked back and forth, there's the experience of both the melody and the rhythm that happens. What do the children learn how? First, they learn the facts of life such as how groups are formed, how selection happens, how relationships are formed, how to thrive, how to change your perception, etc., and, and how to deal with the unfairness of life. They also learn how to choose their bodies and respond to situations, that is the selection and response. But they also learn how belonging works, how allegiance happens, how distinctiveness as well as communality, thrive side by side. They learn the value of doing things properly and doing the proper things, which are detected, dictated by the circumstances of their doing those things. That is the context of their existence. So that is the norms. But they also learn perhaps how to adapt to situations. If it was a, a competitive game and you have not been selected, how do you behave after that? That is something that they learn in the playground through the music. They learn that they are not necessarily the very best, and that is the reality of existence. They learn that hard work often pays. They learn the value of allegiance and friendship, collaboration, and partnership. How do they learn these in the lyrics of the songs, which are repeated throughout their childhood? They learn these in the games, the physical activities that accompany the singing. They learn these in the negotiations in which they engage while choosing their team members or, while, or, or uh, when they're desiring to be the one who is selected. They learn these in the subtle commentaries that accompany their actions in the game songs. Sometimes they're rebuked that they were not fast enough and so the team lost. They learn these in those outright rebukes that might at, at times sound very cruel, but are perhaps responsible for their excellence, their strength, and their resilience later, later on in life. A question that always comes is, where do these fit? That has been always one of the questions of, of, of my research. Where does that fit into the modern classroom today? Where will this fit into our sustainability agenda? And it is, of course, a loaded question, but it is necessary because for us as teachers, what we do revolves around knowledge, and we are doing this right now for sustainable futures. 
And so the daily experience of life becomes valuable learning space. These songs and their contexts and content are valuable for education purposes, primarily because they reflect reality as experienced by the young ones who perform them. And yet they contain information that is useful for humans to negotiate the environment in which they live, starting with the name of the location, the history of the people, the words for plants and colors, the issues of proper relationships, decorum, respect, hard work, diligence, etc. These are all character builders. And so they fit right into the school where learning now takes place. So what's the power of children's songs? The power is that they learn through mischief. I don't know how much time we have, but I'd like to play something, uh, one of a, a clip that I got from, from a, a Nigeria. How much time do I have, Lauren? Because I could stop or we could play a little bit of this. I think you could play like half a minute and then we should probably move on to questions. I don't know if I was audible. Okay. So that was one of the competition games. Thank you so much for listening. I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Um, we very much appreciate that you are here and it's wonderful to hear you. Um, uh, so I'm going to ask um, the community, if you have any questions, um, let's see, we can either uh, do raise hands or if you would like to put your questions in the chat, then um, I am happy to read them as well. So maybe take um, a minute or so um, and see, um, and we'll see what you have. Or comments. They don't have to be questions. <laughs> That's true too. Yeah. Yes. Zoe? Can I go? Hello. Emily, thank you for this very nice and interesting talk and uh, very inspiring. Uh, could you tell us a bit about your research with children's uh, songs and games? Uh, so how did you go to the field? Do how we did take you... another one? Somebody asked if they could speak. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Lauren, somebody asked if they could speak. Maybe we take two questions and I answer, uh, respond to the two together. No. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Hi, it's Irvi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Irvi. Oh, hi. Um, so, Professor Emily, that was very interesting for me because I find myself um, in Abu Dhabi, just recently relocated. And just the last two weeks, I was engaged as a substitute classroom teacher for five to six year olds, which I've never done before in my life. I've done music, but not general classroom uh teaching at all and so <laughs> i was a bit thrown to be honest because apart from anything else everything was te um technologically 
wired up. So there was a smart board and there were lots of different things. So I, I found myself depending very much on my music background to engage these children. Now, what was interesting about this classroom of children, there was 20, 24 of them. And between them, they represented 19 nationalities, um, many of them hybrid. So some of them, I mean, I would say more than 50% identified with double or triple identities. For example, Lebanese, French, American uh, was one. Uh, Ukrainian, Canadian, Zimbabwean was another. So really a strange mixture. So the only thing that united them all every single day, it's a rule in the schools here that we sing the national anthem. Right. So in terms of singing the national anthem, they pumped the idea of respect and getting along with everybody in what is relatively a new nation uh, in, in, in terms of a global context. The UAE is relatively new uh, as, as a set of countries. So I thought it was interesting that all the children, it was flag day last Friday, they all dressed in the, in the colors, including mm -hmm. the staff, myself included, in the colors of the, of the UAE national flag. And each color represented something, for example, white represented peace, I think green was togetherness and so on. But everybody was expected to buy into that through the song which they sang every day. So I wondered what your comments or reflections might be on that anecdote. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's exciting. It's interesting because whereas um, in the Kenyan urban schools, there may not necessarily be different nationalities, but there are kids from different linguistic communities. And the linguistic cultural communities are very, very disparate. Very, you know, the, the difference is 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 like is like night and day. The, this, there's nothing called Kenyan culture. There are different cultures in Kenya, about 43 of them. And on this wall, I can see, I can see um four Kenyans plus me five one two three four and I know three are from the same community so we share language I I see the West is from a different community Kevin I don't know which community. one of the things that we found worked very well is to allow the other children to know something about the other children and often, if like me, they didn't know the song from their community, then that was homework. Please ask mommy to teach you a lullaby from home. And that worked quite a lot. And so the kids got to learn several songs from different languages, and it worked so well. And I noticed she indicated that, you know, there's a similarity in, in there as well. So, so being what you know is yours. And I find songs to be such precious emblems of identity. And I find that children often enjoy them, except in certain instances where some people may not be very kind and they can laugh at others. But if in the classroom you get everybody to teach a little bit of their own song, then I think we get to share a, a bit of a glimpse into the other person's life. And, and I think that that works a lot. Um, so let me leave that at that. But the the, the first question is is uh, how I did, how I got into, how I did my research. You know, I, I went to school, I was at Kingston in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Surrey. And I went armed with a research proposal, ready to go and do all kinds of things. And when we got to zero in on the children's music, and so I thought, I'm, I'm from Kenya. I know Kenyan songs. I can generate them. And I realized I didn't have them. The best way to get them was to go home and fetch them. So I went home. Now, I had been working in, in an academic institution. And so I got my students to 
sing for me children's songs from their communities, but I sent people out to the field, to the primary schools to collect. So just recorded. Uh, we used to have the little cassette recorders that was way back when some people had not yet been born. But <laughs> so I, I just record their singing and then ask the teacher for the lyrics for the for the for the text and then i would just transcribe um using conventional western notation put them in a key that had nothing to do with the pitch at which they had been sung but a key that would make it easy for me to see and out of that just give me one second i want to show you something i hope this is visible so out of that, I got my 118 Kenyan children's songs. And I got to, you know, print them. And um, so because I needed to have it accessible for analysis, the kind of analysis that I was doing, my research was on using Kenyan children's songs to develop a music curriculum for six to eight-year-olds. So I needed to appreciate the musical content. And that would be the pictures, the rhythms, etc. And if this can be visible, I, I have something about um, the sulfur. I did a bit on sulfur because the usage of sulfur in Kenya sulfage is very common, very, very common. So what I have here is an indication of the scale. So I'm calling that that scale. So that how I did my research, went out and collected the songs and, and transcribed them and then did my analysis in order to extract the music elements, the music concepts that I would use to create a teaching program, starting with the simplest ideas for the six-year-olds and getting to the more complex ideas for the older children. That was my research. It is available at the Kingston University Library. The thesis is available and it is accessible. I think if you ask for it, they can uh, make it available for yourselves. Thank you. Okay, I have um, a question. Where in does the that fit into the modern classroom? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I don't know if you, you can see. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. No, no, no. You can see the, the question. Right. Can you tell us more? about where, where does that fit into the modern yes. classroom? Yeah. My students are very influenced by the popular music of hip hop artists and this music is not often suitable for children. How can we take their musical taste mm. into account? Yes. I'll give you an, an example of what somebody, uh, one of um, my colleagues once told me, he was teaching in a secondary school and he was teaching Mozart and Beethoven. And the students basically told him they didn't want Mozart and Beethoven. They wanted Michael Jackson and the rest. And they struck a deal. We'll start with Michael Jackson and then we'll do Mozart. And they agreed. I wonder if you could do that. So we... ...bring our music... <laughs> concepts you can't derive when I was doing this work, children's song repertoire was not necessarily heavily used in school we had row 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 your boat that was music in school mm -hmm. and so what I was doing was deviating from the norm and by bringing this I was doing something that was not being done at the time and, and so that negotiation, I think, is useful. Now, I don't know who is in the classroom in early childhood right now, what they might be doing. I saw Elizabeth. If you're in, maybe you can tell us what you find in the classroom, because I think a lot of times also we have Sunday school songs that are very prevalent. But when you come to class, when you come to the school, the teacher can, especially at in early childhood, the teacher can introduce this and they become part of the children's repertoire, especially early childhood, because I learned that at that early age, they're not that choosy yet. 
and I, I use the word yet deliberately. Elizabeth, what, what have you found? What do you see? I saw her somewhere. Yes, okay, so there. good afternoon, everyone. Good and afternoon. we, can you hear me? Good afternoon. Yes, yes. we can hear you. Yes, can can hear you. Oh, okay. Afternoon. Yes. All right, afternoon. sorry. Hello. <laughs> My camera is off today. Has been. Uh, I'm actually just out of bed. I've not been feeling well, so I'll not put my camera on. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you so much. Uh, that's my professor. That was my supervisor. Uh, so I'm I'm um, I'm privileged to be hearing her speaking about this. And actually, uh, what I've done in my own um, academic life has been greatly influenced by her work. But going back to what children are doing, um, okay. So I think they are doing what is in the environment. For example, uh, she talks about Sunday school songs. And yes, uh, apart from schools where they do not encourage, uh, say, faith-based music, Sunday school songs are used very much because of the values. Remember, the learning is very functional. So teachers believe that uh, children will learn, you know, about life. Because most of those songs uh, talk about, say, love, you know, talk about things, about values that are desirable. And so teachers are going to take up uh, songs like that. Um, sometimes they use some popular songs, maybe not popular songs as such in the, you know, uh, like what you think of Michael Jackson and so on, but songs like, uh, you know, like uh, uh, We Are the World, We Are the Children, you know, songs, uh, international songs, but songs that encourage unity. So what I just find is that, Teachers go for functionality a lot because, again, most of the teachers are not uh, specialists in music. They're generalists. So they're going to pick what is in the environment. And sometimes they do pick songs that are in the environment and then they put uh, they they change the lyrics to suit what, the ch what they think the children want to learn. For example, they use such uh, popular song tunes to, uh, to make songs for counting, to make songs for... Uh, uh, for managing, you know, the children's day. Those in early childhood, we know that that the children's day is managed by with music a lot. You know, uh, moving from one routine to another. But the use of indigenous songs is still uh, not very much a practice because of what Professor talks about. The fact that uh, many of us are really far removed from those songs. And in fact, when I was in school, when I do was doing my own research for early childhood, and I would ask teachers about those songs. It was such nostalgia for them. You know, they'll say, oh, yeah, I remember those songs. Then I asked, but why don't you use them? Then they say, oh, but because we have so many different cultural groups in class and and so we wouldn't know how to use those songs. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure I've answered the question, but I think that most generalist teachers will go for songs that are functional, especially that inculcate positive values in children. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you. So, so I, I think my take is that you can be very deliberate. You have to be very deliberate about it and perhaps start by interspersing the traditional music, um, you know, in between some of the things that they enjoy doing so that you start building the taste for it. I know I am aware of instances where parents have complained that they didn't want their children learning that kind of music. I know that, <laughs> that we know we've come across that, but I, I don't know how it is in your particular space. Uh, but my take is that, and and, and I'll misquote Kodai, that the, the, that the Fox song, that Fox song is the ch child's musical mother tongue. And I find it really crucial, but maybe that's, just because that's the way I am wired, that I love my cultural music, seriously do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we just have a few more minutes there. So there's um, another question in the chat. Um, I don't know if you can see. Um, <clears throat> it says, thank you for sharing. I see the children in a very natural musical situation which needs to be learned in the modern music classroom. My question is whether children's musical creativity 
is taken into account? Do children have the opportunity to participate in the construction of the musical text or just in the musical activity? Thank you. Uh, I'm looking at that question in, in two different ways. The concept of composition, mm -hmm. the concept of creating music in an oral culture, it is it is very continuous. Yeah. Because today we will be singing about one thing and tomorrow because we're in a different space, <laughs> something else has happened and we're using that tune to us. And in that in that in that um way, yes, because they're always generating their music. And I'll I'll give another example. My my younger, my younger child that sounded like a tune, but there are more words than tunes. And he kept picking things and creating his own words, vocables. So so he was making up, he was generating this story around what was happening around him. So that happens in that kind of space, especially in the play field. Then we come to school. We come to the classroom where the notion of composition appears to be rather structured and it has some serious rules that inhibit creativity. If I say that, does it make sense? <laughs> okay. And, and, and so um, it, it takes a very ingenious teacher to allow children to just play and you tell them, this is what we're going to do. Can you give me a song? Can you just do a song? And then they will create their own words. So that happens, but not in all the environments. As Elizabeth mentioned, not all the schools have specialist music teachers. So the skills of encouraging creativity in that manner is not accessible to all. But where you have teachers who have had a musical training, the environment that they create and the tasks that they give to the children allow them to create their own lyrics, their own tunes. And so that, that um, creativity is enhanced, is encouraged. I hope that kind of answers the question. The, the question. Um, in Portugal, okay. I like that. I like and 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 thank you, thank you, Manuela, for sharing that uh, um, that link because I think that is important for that kind of music. I, I I think one of the things that we perhaps encourage as teachers is when one learns existing music, when they participate in existing music, they are building a repertoire of sounds, of intervals, of note values. So when it comes to their creating their own music, they already have some, some vocabulary that they can use. So, and, and I really appreciate, you know, the value of already existing material that can then help them as they generate their own. As Elizabeth mentioned, sometimes teachers will use existing melodies and use new lyrics in them, you know, with, with those melodies to get the children to sing something different, a little more interesting, a little more exciting. And especially when we use music for teaching other content areas. Um, so you use a song to teach, like I think it happens all over the world, to teach um, multiplication. Uh, you, see, you use a, a me melody to, to teach spelling, all those. So, yeah. Thank you. Maybe I stop there. Yes, I think, um, thank you so much. And there, if you would like to, there are a couple of other comments in the chat, but I think at this point, um, we are going to take a five minute break. We'll come back at, or four minute break. We'll come back at 10 after 10. Um, and then we will have time for small group discussion. So thank you very much, everyone. Everyone, and we'll see you in about five minutes.
and it's nice that you can host ECME again after 2020. What that was 2020 that was supposed to be. 2020. Yeah. yeah. Yes, that was the again. Yeah. But now. <laughs> oh my, okay. that's you. Yeah, we are back from, from the breakout rooms and it would be lovely to briefly wrap up um, and share what you were discussing so that if if you could um, share in the in the chat the pertinent points from your room and maybe someone of the some one of the, the group could share so that we could hear hear something from every group. So please if you write your important or main main uh, themes in your in the chat and then share. I am laughing with Jess. I'm just laughing with her comment. <laughs> There's never enough time because everybody's well, got so many interesting things to say. With that. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, in a nutshell, I suppose our, our, our group was, was talking about the huge benefits of singing as a kind of um, uh, a way not only of conveying musical information, but also the 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 other benefits that that there are from from singing in terms of learning language and and just the the you know the um the, all the all the things you were seeing saying really Emily that that was the resonances really the the great impact of songs and singing for for human thriving I suppose and we were just getting to hear from from Satu and her work with the Helsinki uh, orchestra and that we didn't quite get to the detail of that but um, looking forward to seeing and hearing her in Helsinki. It's good to have these temptations that that you can continue. Thank you Jessica. Uh, then um, what what did other groups uh, talk about who would like to go next? Zoe Please. Hello again. We, oh, we mentioned how uh, much uh, this multicultural world is respect is uh, reflected in the children's world. As I think in uh, many countries, uh, children like to speak uh, and to learn songs from other cultures and even nonsense syllables and songs which is very good and it opens up their mind and uh, their world. And uh, Natasha was telling us about a book that they are about to prepare, they are preparing with the European Association of Music Teachers. Right, Natasha? Yeah. Yes, and if I can add on that. That was an idea that we had many, many years ago because we, we can see us teachers that when we want to teach something from another culture we usually go in books or in, in websites to find some materials and maybe what we find is not that representative of the culture that we want to to teach so we decided to invite the national coordinators of the european association for music in schools but also people from europe that do not have a national coordinator to um, select one uh, traditional folk uh, song from the country and uh, give us not a lesson plan but some activities on how we can uh, teach it uh, in specific ages that uh, the song is uh, uh, refers to and also uh, submit an audio of uh, of the the song and uh we're doing it now these next three months i'm one of the editors of this edition so maybe maybe later on as is may we can think about it in a more global um uh, way at the moment we're gonna have one song from each country so just the starting point. And this is uh, part of the Eudamus, which is the European um, day for music in schools that we celebrate, uh, which is the 15th of March. Uh, yeah, that, that's all. 
But uh, if I can add to what uh, Emily was saying, uh, thank you, Emily, for your presentation. Um, I think that sometimes when we talk about songs, we uh, and and the value of the songs, we stay in the more musical uh, value. For example, that uh, it's good for listening, it's good for um, uh, singing, it's good for playing and moving and dancing. And I really liked the fact that you talked about those communal values that we share and can be shared through the songs because. We we know that, but now you you presented it in a more um, holistic, let's say, or a complete way. That there are a lot of things to talk about, and how life might be hard because you're not selected, and how you feel, and maybe maybe these are things that we should prepare the children and discuss with the children besides doing the musical activities or besides talking about the topic of the song. So there are some things to think about it more than we do in our activities. So thank yeah. you. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, Zoe. And one more group to, to share their thoughts. Or... I can do it if you want. Yeah, please Nobody do. Please. So, so we started off by resonating with the fact that the, this question, like, what are you doing? And then we came to the, that, that leads to the question, what is actually music? Is it what we as adults think, or is it what the kids define as being music for them? And then we got on talking and one interesting point that was raised too actually is like, yeah, okay, children sing about many things. It can be anything, it can be fruit, can be trees, can be anything. But also the, there was the idea to integrate sounds from nature as a way to raise awareness of nature and so contribute to, um, to sustainability, ecological sustainability, and not necessarily by the texts of the songs but more but by what is integrated in the songs. And I, I thought that was a really nice idea that was raised. That's where we got. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Luke. And thank you for, for all, all for the discussions and, and sharing. It's, it's good to have lots of things to look forward to in continuing these discussions and what's the uh, best possible place to do that than Helsinki. So can you, Lauren, share our last slide? Because we want to, we hope ECME as, a, as an ECME commission to, to see you all in Helsinki and, and uh, being able to continue these discussions and, and create many, many more. And And you can find Find the information, of course, in in uh, Isme website. So, so um, thank you for for this cafe and discussions, and and it was a pleasure, great pleasure for me and for the whole commission. So, over to Lauren to end. Well, I just echo thank you. Thank you all for your thoughts and your contributions. And um, I have many notes to keep thinking about. And I really hope that we could see you maybe in Helsinki because then we'll have more time to just keep talking and learning. So thank you again, Emily, for your time and your contribution and just how you lead us uh, as a musical um, people. So thank you so much. And um, Goodbye. Have a great rest of your day, night, wherever you are. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon. And we can also we can also put the the link to to sign up for the newsletter. Okay. Yes. If, here. If there's someone someone who who uh still is not. Yes. Let me uh, get it. But so that was one. Thank you so much. Or speak to to see you in Helsinki. To, Yes, see you now, Helsinki, Emily. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Appreciate it. Here's bye. the link. I put it in the chat. Thank you. Bye.